welcome to the plenary conversation on nature and climate. My name is Gim Hui Nyo, Managing Director at the World Economic Forum. Humanity is in a crisis. Climate change is actually not new, and scientists have been warning us about that for decades. What is new is that humanity is now experiencing the limits and the effects with more intensity and frequency. 2023 was the hottest year on record, and we all know someone, or have heard of someone, who has experienced more extreme drought, more extreme rainfalls, heat waves, wildfires, and these effects will get worse as the earth gets closer and even cross the tipping points. We were at 1.48 degrees Celsius last year, and we will likely exceed El Nino. Uh, we will likely exceed 1.5 over the next few years because of El Nino effects and also the accumulation of carbon emissions. And scientists are now telling us that even in the most optimistic of all scenarios, we are headed for an overshoot. 1.6, 1.7 degrees, decades of climatic disruptions, upheavals and catastrophes. What does this mean for the food we eat, the water we drink, the homes and the lifestyles we have? What does it mean for our children, their children, the people we love? What does it mean for the things we care about? Some of you in the audience would have heard of the, the Chinese uh, translation for the word crisis, uh, Wei Ji, and you know that Wei means danger, Ji means opportunity. So in, in crisis, in danger, we can find opportunity. But because we are in a climate emergency, I don't really want to just talk about opportunity today. I want to push the panelists a little bit more. Right, uh, to talk about systems change. The levers we need to pull, the buttons we need to press, maybe the silver bullet, the magic one, the heroes and the heroines we need to produce big changes in everything and turn the tide of history. So today I'd like to introduce you to another Chinese uh, phrase, uh, not weiji, which is uh, opportunity in crisis, but qi ji, which is that we actually need miracles. Right, uh, so my challenge to the panelists today, and I'm giving them a few minutes to think about is, what are these uh, system change levers that we need to create the miracles? In oriental medicine, uh, we talk about acupuncture points. You would have heard of it, uh, some of you. And by stimulating some of these key acupuncture points, we can correct imbalances and blockages in the flow of energy through the human body and ultimately restore health and well-being. So here, I'm talking about acupuncture points in our social, economic and political systems that can unlock human potential, human creativity to restore humanity's harmony with nature. What are the systemic responses? What are the acupuncture points we need to ensure that we can continue to endure as a species? for the next seven generations. So I'm giving you some time to think about this uh, before I invite you on stage. Uh, but first, uh, to inspire all of you, I would like to celebrate a group of people. And they are actually uh, the right people we should celebrate right now as we talk about acupuncture points, because they bring purpose and passion, stamina and leadership in their mission to bring about positive social change. Let us watch a short film. The evolution of social innovation over the last 25 years has been quite remarkable, especially the way that people perceive and understand what social innovation is. There is a wider recognition for the work that we do and a clear distinction between conventional business and, and a social business. Social entrepreneurs are pioneers of tomorrow's world because tomorrow's world will have many crises to solve and social entrepreneurs are already in this new economy in a way. As social innovators, we can actually work together to create a community where collectively we can solve the problems. Milton Friedman, the famous economist, said the business of business is business. But today, the business of business is also plastics, also migration. Social innovation also includes in innovation of institutions, methodologies, the way we do things. We play a very crucial role in bridging that gap between 
ordinary people and the highest making decision bodies across the world. Individuals and small enterprises can make a big difference. One of the big things that the Schwab Foundation does is to bring them together and reinforce each other and share things. The Schwab Foundation has the possibility of expanding the impact and the potential of the individuals in a way that is very unique. Immediately, we stopped feeling alone. Being part of the Schwab Foundation, seeing like-minded individuals and seeing how we can actually work together and it's just learning lessons from each other. We understand the magnitude of the problems we are trying to face and realizing we need more innovators, we need more individuals, we need more governments to be part of it. With that common strength, we can do much, much more than you could just do on your own. Everyone should be a social innovator. Everyone should be considering that what they're doing is important and it's urgent for society and they're doing it in the best possible way. To invite uh, Hilda Schropp, uh, founder and co-chair of the Schropp Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, uh, to present the Schropp Foundation 2024 Social Innovation Awardees. Hilda. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, for your introduction and welcome to all of you. I'm delighted to be here today to announce the Social Innovators of the Year 2024, who will join the network of the Schwab Foundation of Social Entrepreneurship. For over two decades, we have championed innovative business models that contribute to a more inclusive and sustainable society. The foundation has grown a community of the foremost global pioneering social innovators who are driving systemic change and have improved the lives of over 890 million people. This is the kind of leadership that will be needed to transform our economic systems and preserve the planet. The 2024 awardees show how innovative approaches to deep-seated problems can deliver transformation in areas such as healthcare and education, finance and law, the empowerment of women and young people, poverty alleviation, and countering the, effect, effect, the effects of climate change. The Schwab Foundation Awards are hosted in a long-standing partnership together with the Mozeppe Foundation, founded on the philosophy of Ubuntu the African concept of giving and caring for your neighbor and your community. Our sincere thanks go to Patrice and Precious Motsepe of the Motsepe Foundation. We recognize social and innovators in four categories, and I'm now delighted to announce the winners of the year 2024. Social entrepreneurs, Founders or CEOs of a profit or non-profit social enterprise, pioneering systemic and impactful models, addressing social inequalities and vulnerable ecosystems. Rudaina Abdo, Taki, Lebanon. Gerald Avila, Barefoot Law, Uganda. Suchin Bajaj, Ujala Signus Hospitals, India. Catalina Koch Duque, Fundacion Misangre, Colombia. Temi Giva Tubasun, Life Bank Group, Nigeria. Sha Li Jia, Shenzhen Power Solution, People's of Republic of China. Achai Tasha, Frontier Markets, India. Mohamed Amin Zariat, Tibu Africa, Morocco. Corporate Social Innovators. Leaders within multinational or regional companies who drive the development of products, services, initiatives, or business models that address societal and environmental challenges. Saugata Banerjee, Essilor, Luxoptica, Singapore. Rushika Singhal, Medtronic Labs, USA. Public social innovators. Leaders in the public sector, in government, or in international organizations 
who harness the power of social innovation to create public good through policy, regulation or public initiatives. Chantal Lynn Carpentier, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development and United Nations Interagency Task Force on Social and Solidarity Economy, Switzerland. Juan Manuel Martinez Louvier, Instituto Nacional de la Economía Social, Mexico. Vivi Yulasvati, Ministry of National Development Planning, Indonesia. Collective Social Innovators, an award to recognize organizations coming together to address complex problems that cannot be tackled by individual actors, using shared knowledge, shared human capital, networks and innovations to achieve a common social or environmental goal. Strive Together, led by Jennifer Blatz, Vanessa Carlo Miranda, Colin Groth. Financing Alliance for Health, led by Angela Kichaga. Amazon Sacred Headwaters Alliance, led by Domingo Peas, Atossa Soltani, Belen Pais. Congratulations to all of you, and thank you for your tireless commitment to building a more inclusive and sustainable world. May I now... In yeah. May I now invite the awardees to join me on stage to be recognized as the Social Innovators of the Year 2024. And I would like to ask also the panelists and Precious Machete to join me on stage, as well as Chief Putani for a photo opportunity. I hope you are ready. We have a distinguished panel with us today. Catherine Hayhoe, climate scientist. Ajay Banga, president of the World Bank. Kristen Lina Jujiva, managing director of the IMF. Jesper Brodin from IKEA, as well as Andre Hoffman, uh, who is a philanthropist as well as a family business owner. Let me start with Catherine. You're a climate scientist. You crunch data, you analyze models, you provide the evidence that climate change is happening, human beings are the cause of it. And more importantly, some of you would know her, she's one of the most effective communicators on climate change around. So my question to you is twofold. One is, can you help explain to this audience how to think about the environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. Because when businesses and governments talk about carbon emissions, 
Can they also connect the nexus to water, mm -hmm. to nature, to the ocean, to land use, to people? Mm -hmm. That's the first part of my question. Mm -hmm. The second part of my question is how can we make this into a conversation mm -hmm. that all politicians, regardless of your political affiliations, will care about, and that you will help them win votes on the ground? Mm. So, Catherine. I should say that to the last question, that's one of the reasons why I live in Texas, is to figure out the answer to that question. So the way I think about our current challenge is like this. For years, centuries, even millennia, we have been living as if our planet were flat and infinite. What I mean by that is that we have been living as if there was always somewhere new to go when we need more, and there's always somewhere to put our waste when we create it. But we don't live on an infinite flat planet. I know you could probably find a few people on YouTube who claim we do. But most of us know that we live on a round, finite planet with over 8 billion people. And so to me, the phrase sustainability is so basic, it just means living as if the planet were round, which it is. So we confront multiple crises today that all stem from overuse of nature's resources, and climate change is one of those. We've known since the 1800s that digging up and burning coal back then, and oil and gas today, produces heat-trapping gases that are causing the planet to warm. This year was the warmest on record, but it was entirely in line with what scientists have been pre predicting since the first climate model was calculated by hand in the 1890s. So this is no surprise. But it is still shocking to see the floods, the heat waves, the droughts, the wildfires, the hurricanes and cyclones play out live in front of our eyes, affecting people and places that we know and love. It hits us in a different place. It's not just about our head anymore, it's about our heart. So that relates to the second part of your question. How do we have these conversations? As scientists, we live primarily in the head, so to speak. Data, facts, information. But in order to understand why it matters to each of us, we have to help people connect this crisis and all the other crises with the overuse of our planet, the biodiversity crisis looming right behind the climate crisis, we need to help people connect it with what they already care about. And if we don't know what that is, we have to figure out what it is by asking them questions and listening to the answers. But even that is insufficient because we could have the whole world worried, and actually most of the world is already worried about climate change. The majority of people around the world are worried, but if we don't know what to do, we'll do nothing. So the last step is, and this is why I'm so excited to have this panel here today, the last step is we have to help people connect their heads to their hearts, to their hands. What do real climate solutions look like? And Jesper and I were at an event just this morning that was all about asking everyone in the room, what solution is your organization taking that you are proud of? And you can hear dozens, even hundreds of these solutions these days, and this is really the key to our future, is talking about, sharing, and implementing solutions at every scale. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Let me turn to RJ. You assumed the role of president of World Bank about six months ago, maybe middle of last year. And one of the first things you did was to review the vision of the World Bank to connect the alleviation of poverty with a livable planet. The World Bank has been around for 70 years. It is the world's largest development organizations. You're involved with more than 100 developing emerging countries, 12,000 projects since the beginning. You have described the World Bank as a knowledge bank, as a money bank, because you give grants, loans, but you also transfer knowledge and best practices. I think that's great. But a common criticism of the World Bank it is that the organization is too bureaucratic. Processes take too long to reach the people who need help desperately. But I understand why, because an organization as large as the World Bank is not easy to be fast and agile. You cannot, because you need to protect governance and system integrity. So if I may bring in another Chinese phrase, 
Sun Gao Huang Di Yuan. When the emperor is high on the mountains, uh, sorry, when the, when, when the mountains are high, the emperor is far away, meaning it's, it's hard to know what's really going on the ground. And I'd like to ask you and probe you, how do you think about systems change within an organization as large as the World Bank, as powerful as the World Bank, to make sure that whatever changes you're making actually really translates to what is being felt on the ground? And how would you think about the role of the bank in catalyzing new growth model, partnerships with other organizations to stimulate change within the broader social, economic, and governance systems that we have today? Yeah, so I mean, look, a journey fueled by hope is realized by deeds. And so merely saying that I've got a new way of thinking about things or announcing policy pronouncements will not change the reality of what we face on the ground every day. What we have is an existential climate crisis. We cannot think of eradicating poverty without caring about climate. We cannot think about eradicating poverty without caring about health care. We cannot think about eradicating poverty without caring about food insecurity and fragility. These are, if you don't like it, tough luck. This is the reality that we have a set of intertwined crises. And so when the World Bank changed its vision to go from eradicating poverty, important, but eradicating poverty on a livable planet, what we're doing is embracing those challenges and widening the aperture with which the bank and its people look at the challenges we have. The reality is we cannot afford another set of decades of emissions-heavy growth. That's just the reality. So since we had it talking about climate for a minute, at COP28, and this tells you the kinds of things that can be done to change, the World Bank made five commitments. The first one is 45% of our financing would go towards climate financing by 2025, mm. not 2050, by 2025. Because I think a sense of urgency is our only savior in this current circumstance. By the way, we were already running at about 35, so 45 is ambitious, but not crazy. It's entirely possible. More importantly, half of that would go to mitigation, emissions, but half of that would go to adaptation, because the developing world sees climate from a slightly different lens from the effect rather than the cause. And those of us in the developing world who tend to see climate only from emissions, we are missing the opportunity of engaging the hearts and minds of people all over the world in what matters to them on the ground every day. So that's the first thing. The second thing we announced is that we will connect 100 million people in Africa to renewable power by 2030. So we announced 100, I'm actually working on 200. There are 600 million people in Africa without access to electricity. That, to me, that's a human right. If you do not have electricity, you have nothing. So 200 million people, if the bank can get by 2030, not alone, our money, other public sector money, and most importantly, the private sector's money is required to make this happen. Third, we've talked about methane. Uh, methane from flaring is known, but rice paddy cultivation, waste management, and dairy husbandry can help you enormously with combating methane. Methane is 80 times more dangerous than carbon dioxide. It gets only 2% of climate financing today. We have a misalignment with what we need to focus on. We're talking about working with 15 countries and taking out 10 million tons of methane by focusing on rice paddy, on animal and dairy, and on waste management. Fourth, small countries cannot absorb the impact of a catastrophe. They can lose, even if they're wealthy, they can lose double digits of their, of their GDP in the course of a few hours. We're going to give them the chance not to pay back loans owed to us for two years, including the interest, and we'll fund that cost because we have to be there for them in their bad days, not just in their good days. And the last part is we're going to venture, eyes wide open, into helping carbon credits, voluntary carbon markets and carbon credits in forestry, projects where we are involved, where we can guarantee the environmental credit, but also the social value, meaning the money goes to the community, not just to the government. These are five things. We're not doing them alone. I'm doing them in partnership with Kristalina. I'm doing them in partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank. I'm doing them in partnership with the private sector. Jesper can talk to you about what the private sector does. These, these challenges are too big for any one of us to think. 
that we can do it ourselves. That would be a travesty if we tried to do that. We have to get together because in being together is our chance to win. So back to where I started, a journey fueled by hope is realized by deeds. Don't forget that. Thank you. Kristalina and Ajay alluded to it. Uh, in fact, we're delighted that we have the World Bank and the IMF on stage together. But more importantly, <laughs> to talk about climate and nature. <laughs> because there are many things you can choose to talk about in Davos, right? Uh, but the fact that the two of you actually prioritize climate and nature is, gives us hope, right? Uh, and the fact if you can work together, Combining policy with finance and knowledge, I think we have many more ingredients available to support the transition to a, a better future. I would like to la ask for your reflections on policy, because obviously good policy, good governance mm -hmm. are one of the key levers for systems change. And you've been in this role for four years now. There's been a surge in government interest in climate transition, mm -hmm. nature issues over the last four years especially. COP28, you were there. Hundreds of global leaders met, right? Uh, we've never seen such strong momentum. But the stock tick is telling us that progress is still too slow, right? Uh, we are not ambitious enough, we are not implementing fast enough. And I'd like you to share some reflections on what are the policy measures that has worked, mm -hmm. but more importantly, what are the ones that really desperately need to get going, right? Uh, and between the COPs, mm -hmm. governments need to do their homework. So what is the homework and the advice that you will give to all governments from the IMF's perspective? Well, let me uh, first join Ajay by saying that um, uh, we first and foremost need to come together. And uh, Ajay, in front of my board of directors, said World Bank and IMF, one plus one makes three. And I would argue that we have to have the ambition to make it four, or five, or six. Uh, and uh, that is my most important message to everybody, that together we can succeed. What was COP28 for all of us? It was the COP of hope, because results exceeded expectations. And that was the outcome of actions taken by governments, by private sector, by international organizations. Uh, Al Gore, uh, who of course is the champion of this cause, uh, today uh, said in a meeting that uh, political will, which is what made actions possible, is a renewable resource. It doesn't get charged by the sun or the wind. It gets charged by success of our actions. So when we look into the uh, year ahead and years to follow, I want to concentrate on three actions that from our expertise, from a policy standpoint, are paramount. Action number one, we know that today our collective commitments, the, end, the, the um, nationally determined contributions, collectively, they fall around 50% short of where we have to be by 2030, lift up ambition and front load action. So we need to breathe in the necks of governments, they have to do that. And we as an institution can help them to cost it and plan it together with the World Bank. So it is not a you know, dream, it is doable. Action number two. I am sick and tired listening to people saying, oh God, it's so expensive. Where are we going to find the money? We are talking about getting to five billion uh, by the end of the uh, decade. Last year, the world spent over seven, sorry, uh, five trillion, my apologies. Last year, the world spent more than seven trillion dollars in direct and indirect fossil fuel subsidies. 
1.3 billion, uh, sorry, 1.3 trillion, I need to get my, my trillions and billions right, 1.3 trillion direct fossil fuel subsidies. Pull this back and put it to support climate action. And then look into the indirect subsidies that are health costs, but also not pricing carbon. At the fund, we, I, I'm now blue in the face saying that we cannot accelerate carbonization fast enough without pricing carbon with predictable increase of carbon price. It has to be $85 by 2030. If we just collect the equivalent on the 25% of emissions today priced, we would get about 800 billion. If we price 50% of, of emissions, we will get 1.5 trillion. So my point is, let's get to bringing resources, taking them from where they hurt, putting them where they help. And my third and last point is for each and every one of us, to, to do what Ajay did, and uh, you know, bravo Ajay. Be clear in what you pledge and do what you say. For us at the fund, what we pledge is first to bring climate in macro policy discussions, emission reduction for countries that are high emitters, adaptation for vulnerable countries. And we are doing it country after country. Work with countries on how they can deal with financial sector risks due to climate shocks. And we are a financial institution. Put money where our mouth is. We have now 40 billion in long-term financing. First time in the history of the IMF, we lent 20 years 10 and a half years grace, concessional terms for middle income, vulnerable middle income countries and low income countries. And guess what? Last year, we started one year, we have done 16 programs. And it was the World Bank that gave us the foundation, the analytical foundation uh, to do so. What I commit is that the IMF will be systematically engaged with private sector, with other organizations, with governments, because we are, today, we are systemically significant institution in the fight against climate change. And we will continue that fight. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I think it's a good time for me to bring in the corporate voice. Yes, sir. You are the co-chair for the Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders at the World Economic Forum. Uh, it's more than 130 of you. Collectively, your emissions, scopes one, two, three, is almost equivalent to that of the United States. Mm. So you're a very powerful group who have committed to SBTI science-based targets, which mm. is that commitment to net zero uh, by 2030, 2050. You're not just mobilizing your peers, you're also leading by example. And I think to the points by RJ and Kristalina, mm. the important thing is action, deeds. And IKEA has been able to demonstrate business growth while cutting absolute emissions. Mm. And that's very impressive, right? Because we know that the growth that we've experienced over the years has been powered with an overconsumption of Earth's finite resources, 1.75 times what we need, right? Of 1.75 times of planet Earth's resources. And the big question that companies have to navigate is, can they continue to grow? Can they continue to generate profits while reducing, cutting emissions, stop depleting natural resources, meaning give Earth a time to regenerate itself, 
And a key lever is obviously in innovation. And that's where I would like to poke you a little bit. Because it essentially means we have to build new economic models, new businesses, and poss possibly new lifestyles of humanity mm. that are good, just as good or even better mm. than what we have today. And you have been IKEA for almost three decades now. Right? And IKEA is known as a company that's been innovating on many fronts. Right? Uh, you reinvented furniture shopping, so now even families take it as a weekly outing. Mm. Right? You've uh, created modular furniture so every one of us can build our own uh, furniture at home. Living solutions, the list goes on. And I'd like you to reflect a little bit on what is that secret sauce right, uh, that we could potentially learn from what you've experienced, what you're leading within your company, and help us apply this secret sauce to the possibilities of our future. Right, uh, so one way we can have our cake and eat it too. Right? So, Jesper. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to, to everybody on the stage here. And, and uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Wef, for, for hosting us. That was a big question to start with, um, uh, but I think it's the right one. Let me maybe start by just expressing. Let, I tried to connect both my, my mind on this topic, but also my heart on it. Uh, this is the decade. We have all understood this is the decade when it needs to shift, it needs to change. Um, it is a decade of both outrage, but also uh, hope and optimism. And I, I sit with uh, the strange mix of sentiments, both uh, incredible optimism, but also doubts and fears for the future. Um, but if I, if I start with the, the reasoning from a corporate perspective, and I know that there are so many corporate leaders that share my uh, view on why this is important for us. And so if I start with the, the rationale, how could it be possible to build a future business model on depletion of nature, resources, people? Uh, um, it's simply the absolute worst idea. So, um, that doesn't mean that the transition and transformation is easy. There can be incremental changes, but I do believe that all of us need to go to, through a massive uh, uh, transformation. When I look at IKEA, we, are, we have many people, many companies, and a huge network if you look at the total scope three. The secret source is leadership. Um, a leadership to accept the responsibility, uh, to commit, if you like, without having all the answers based on the knowledge that the alternative is absolutely unthinkable. If I look at the economic rationale, which is one of the greatest myths uh, today, is that um, sustainability and climate would come at a premium. If you follow that route, obviously, it would only be a few rich people who could afford um, uh, doing it right. So what we're actually doing, what we're talking about here together on the stage, is the biggest reformation and transformation of economy, as we have seen. AI, super exciting, interesting, but it's minuscule compared to the complete reshift of economy that we are accepting and being in the front line of, of leading. Um, resource smart, nature smart, um, climate smart is cost smart. So the opposite is not true <laughs> to start with. Uh, carbon is not only a huge uh, uh, existentialistic problem for humanity, it's the biggest uh, cost factor in any value chain. Uh, and then you can say again, there are some low-hanging fruits and some transformations and need for collaboration, but that is the truth of the fact. Um, I, I will humbly share the number. Um, I say so because, of course, you never know what's around the corner, but if you look at IKEA's total footprint and a total growth since uh, 2016, since uh, the amazing uh, Paris Agreement, uh, we are at 30.9% business growth, so it's okay. Uh, we are 24.3% absolute carbon reduction. Not relative, absolute carbon reduction. Now, it tells me three things when I share that. One, it's uh, possible. It's not an illusion or an idea, it's a fact. Uh, secondly, it tells me it is good business to be a good business. Three, it tells me I saying that means I'm incredibly committed to the future, of course. We're halfway to the half reduction by 2030, and there's so many challenges. So the, the road is going to be bumpy, but it's going to be down here from here. Um, I believe the companies in the, for instance, in the World Economic uh, uh, Climate Alliance, these are the brands and companies that you will see in 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. The companies who are left on the station waiting um, are getting very close to the too late factor. Um, but we need more. We need more people who test and try. We need more people who 
as Catherine and I spoke to this morning, who embrace taking actions, sharing, collaborating in new ways, because the problem is far too big. And if you ask me what the miracle is, there may be some different miracles that, that needs to happen, but we need the energy sector to take full responsibility. Because even if I'm incredibly optimistic after COP, the achievements in Compaper, which was a great achievement, uh, was great progress. We are at the point where we know that a lot of sectors, industry, including the energy sector, are not enough committed, are not speaking out, are not uh, showing vulnerability for the unknown, and are still, as we have heard uh, today, investing in the old economy. So basically, when the car came, throwing more horses at the problem wasn't a good idea. Maybe temporarily, but what we're seeing right now is throwing a lot of horses when there is something totally new around the corner. So I would say invite to America for leaders to be courageous and say, not on my shift, I will be part of, of, um, of making this transformation. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to turn to Andre. Uh, you come from an illustrious family. You're the fourth generation of a very successful family business. In fact, uh, your father, Luke Hoffman, uh, was a conservationist. He set up the World Wildlife Fund, among various other conservation organizations. And you inherited your father's love for nature. You've been a key proponent for integrating nature in business, promoting business as a force for good. And I would like you to speak to the notion of time, the intergenerational stewardship. It's more intuitive in family businesses. Maybe it's not so obvious for companies, governments that have a very short life cycle. In fact, I, I read that this is coming down, right? Uh, the, the, the term of a, a CEO is actually dropping. And it is made worse by the fact that we are very much enabled by technology today. Right, uh, instant gratification. We, we prioritize all our short-term needs over long-term goals, even though, even though the, we know that delayed gratification can be a lot more rewarding. And we know that slowly built success is actually a lot more solid, more trusted, more sustainable. How would you reconcile the short and the long-term? Not just wearing your hat as a family business owner, but also wearing the hats of CEOs who know that maybe they, they will no longer be in that job 10 years, 15 years, or even shorter. And how can we incentivize these long-term behaviors, long-term thinking, so that businesses, governments, they always leave living the place much better than what they took on and what they inherited? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Kim, for, the, for this question, which is, of course, a very wide question. First of all, at the age of 65, I'm delighted to hear that my father is always quoted when I'm presented. That's good news. I hope, I hope that the children or my children will, will have the same impact. That's good news. But, but to, to the question of how we're going to be able to do something for the future of, of, um, of the way we, con we construct businesses at the moment, um, yes, the family ownership, the idea of thinking transgenerationally is, is I think, a strong incentive. Um, more than 20 years ago, we established a sustainability committee on our company. And uh, this sustainability committee has always, been, has always been involved into thinking about the next generation. So we have the board which does the, 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 the executes the budget. You have the directors who are uh, constructing the five-year plan. And you have the sustainability committee which I chair, which does the 100 years plan. And how can we sort of organize this in a way where we are using existing resources to be able to make a difference to, to what we do. So how do we do that? Very clearly, we need to reintroduce the notion of nature in the way we do business. Now, nature is not just uh, the panda, which my father indeed uh, uh, protected them with the World Wide Fund for Nature, but, but uh, it, it's also the question of a functional economy. Um, the, 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 the idea of producing value uh, without looking at the immediate consequence of what we're doing 
is a very short-term value. The economists would talk about uh, externalities, but externalities, once they are in the system, eventually come back to the people who started them. So you can create value short-term for a couple of quarters, and everybody will be very pleased with you. But if you don't look after the costs you have started, you're going to have to, to deal with them later. And IKEA is a wonderful example of that. You know, if you, if, you, if you want to really sort of construct that in the wrong way. So how do we include nature into our business? By looking at the consequence of what we're doing, by measuring impact. Now, there is no investment without impact, we all know that, but we also need to make sure that we can understand the consequences and the dependencies that we have on the three main capitals, the social, the human, and the natural. The social we just discussed uh, in this panel, I don't think we need to go much further into it. The natural capital is, um, you know, how can we regenerate, how can we go away from extraction and pollution to go into regeneration. And the human capital, which I think is the one we need to, to all consider, is how do we get towards happiness? How do we use the generation of, uh, of, of uh, um, the wealth generation that business provides in order to really get to that level where we are pleased with what we have and not much more than that? I know it sounds a little bit airy-fairy, and I see a lot of eyes going to the sky in, in the audience, but for me, the, the, this notion that we have to pursue happiness is an incredibly important one. Um, natural capital will suffer less, and in you know, social capital even less, if we do get, to, if we get, we'll go away from the schizophrenia that is institutional, where we behave in a way that we think is expected from us, when in fact we know that what we're doing is wrong. Um, this morning I was at a breakfast and somebody had this wonderful image saying, you know, we all want to eat uh, um, healthily, but when you open the fridge it's full of junk food. And I think our society really sort of uh, needs a bit of that. So uh, you've, uh, you've been good um, uh, Davos visitors this week. You've seen the statement of TNFD, which is now used by more companies. The attractive thing of this sort of system, sort of measurement, is that it gives you an idea to, to, dis, dis, uh, to measure the discrepancy, sorry, the dependencies that your businesses have. So the idea of a business that is completely independent of nature, you know, I, I don't think it will go very far. So, you know, you need to understand how much water you need, what the water supply is, how, how, what will happen when, when you don't have it anymore, and how can you construct a future based on this. So this intergenerational thinking help us to sort of project the, sub the subject in the future. Now, a lot of the things which I've heard until now are, are, are relevant in that context as well. You know, uh, together possible, we need to unite all uh, family businesses of the planet. But we also need to realize that uh, a normal business also has a responsibility to our society. I mean, we are, we are in Davos, and in Davos we have, from the beginning, theorized, uh, Klaus, uh, sorry, Professor Schwab, has since the beginning Fioretta has this idea that we have to work for stakeholders and not for shareholders. So, as a significant shareholder of the family company, I can tell you that if, you only, uh, if, if the company was only managed for me, we would not be where we are today. We are managing for the patient, and the patient is the one that really sort of should come out of this uh, uh, winning. So, I don't know if that replies to your question, but there are a number of different other things we can talk about. Of course, the sense of responsibility. Um, uh, why did my father and some of my, my family spend so much time in philanthropy? Because the system that we have built uh, privileges a couple of people who have more funds than others, and the idea of using that just to go and, and, and spend is not the right thing. With ownership comes responsibility, and you have to do something about that. But as we heard, there's absolutely no way that philanthropy can solve the issue. We're talking trillions of dollars. We have to move into a way which will influence businesses into a positive outcome for everybody. Yep. So let's make a distinction between shareholder and stakeholder and make sure that stakeholder benefit. Thank you. I would like to probe all of you more on leadership. And I think uh, Jesper alluded to that. Um, because you either influence large groups of people or you actually run large organizations. So you have a good feel of how humans behave. Carrots, incentives, so on and so forth. We've been running an annual risk survey, top risks confronting society and economy over the next 10 years. Persistently, environmental risks rank at the top. So we know, right? Uh, but there's a gap with practice. What is missing? How do we bridge this gap between knowledge and practice? Because the people who are filling up the surveys, 
These are 1,200 leaders around the world. So they're the same people making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Any takers? Well, I, I have a very simple uh, solution to this problem. Um, RJ actually applies the same solution. For all these leaders, I have one advice. Get your kids, and especially your grandchildren, if you have some on your phone, put their picture there. And when you don't know what is the right thing to do, look at them, and it will come. It always comes to me, and I know it comes to Ajay. We have responsibility to be stewards of our beautiful small planet's future, because this is the home for the future generations. We have to pass it to them the way we inherited it from our parents. Thank you. Catherine, you want to say A recent global survey conducted by Potential Energy asked people, are you worried or concerned about climate change? And they found again that most people were, and then they asked them, why do you care? And it will not surprise you or anyone to learn that the number one reason that people cited for why they cared all around the world in all different countries was their children, their grandchildren, or the next generation. And when asked to express that in a single word, the word they chose was, again and again, love. Thank you. Uh, can I also say one more thing? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize, but I have been wrestling with this. There is also something that leaders need to embrace and it is responsibility to act even if it is not popular. Mm. <laughs> Face it, do it, because the signal we send, people look up to us. If we waver, if we say, oh, well, let me calculate, how is this going to affect my bottom line this year, this quarter, uh, then we are going to uh, make uh, mistakes. So leaders, step up, be counted. Um. Look, I, I think this is in my new life and coming to where I am today, I think about this in a few different ways. And the first one is that uh, leadership is a question of truth. Hmm. And let's take the topic of natural gas. Europe lives on natural gas. America generates a great deal of natural gas as well. How can we tell the developing world that they cannot have access to natural gas as part of the transition if we live on it ourselves. And so I think there's a little bit of the issue of trust in each other. I actually believe that if you open the taps of natural gas everywhere, you won't be able to close it again. So the wrong answer is to say, let me just do what I want. The correct answer is to say, what's the right way of bridging this situation? These are hard topics. They get emotional, they get political, and as someone said at a lunch a little while ago, the challenge with politics is we know what we need to do. The problem in the democratic world is you probably won't get elected again if you do it. And I think that is a situation that needs to be tackled. That's one part of it. In an organization like the World Bank, I believe the real issue is a sense of urgency and a sense of thoughtful risk-taking in the organization. If we bring urgency to what we do, we change the way in which leaders are empowered to make change happen. And the third part is that, you know, if you look at the private sector, which we think their money is going to be very important in the energy transition that we are going to go through, the reality is we know that solar power and wind power are cheaper per unit than fossil fuel. We know that. This is not a secret. Scale and technology in the last five or ten years have done that for us. Why is it then that trillions of dollars are not flowing in to that space for investing? And if you sit with the private sector, you get three or four things that matter. The first one is clarity on regulatory policy in the country where you're asking them to invest. We can help organizations like us. Al does that all day long. This is what he does. He argues for clarity on policy and vision. I think you need more like him because together we can make change happen on policy in countries. Yep. The second is the issue 
of political risk despite that regulatory policy. Institutions like the World Bank offer political risk insurance. Are we doing enough? No. We do six or seven billion dollars of political risk guarantees in a year. Should we be doing 20? Absolutely. Are we going to do 20 by 2030? Absolutely. That is the second sense of urgency. The third topic is the issue of foreign exchange. We cannot wish away that issue. If you expect a foreign investor to bring dollars, euros, and yen into a country and get paid in local currency, ask Jesper, he will tell you this all day long, or Andre, we are all businessmen. You cannot take that risk on an unexposed basis. These countries don't have hedging markets that are either wide enough or deep enough. Institutions like ours have got to find a way to come in to help fill that gap. We cannot absorb the risk endlessly, but we can be creative and thoughtful in helping to bridge the foreign exchange risk that you cannot expect private investors to take unhedged if you want to bring their capital to the table. And the last item is originate to distribute. We cannot be the ones who do all these projects and put them on our balance sheet. Our balance sheets are finite. And if you wanted a miracle, I would want my capital to multiply many times. But that would be a miracle if it comes true, I'll use it. Meanwhile, can I leverage my balance sheet better? Can I do more than I can with what I have? Because the worst form of leadership is pointing to somebody else to help you out. The best form of leadership is do more with what you have because a sense of urgency must seize you every day of your life. Yes. Thank you. We do need to quickly wrap up. Uh, and uh, I'll give you 10 seconds each because one of the greatest gifts that humanity has been given is the power of imagination, to dream of a better future. What is the hope that you and your organization, the people you influence, would like to bring to the audience here today? We need to end on an optimistic note. Mm -hmm. 10 seconds each so that I can close with uh, Chief Putan. When we live in harmony with nature, the impact on our physical health, our mental health, our own well-being is hard for us to even imagine. The future could be better than we could possibly imagine. I think that the world has come to the conclusion, political leaders and everybody else, that you cannot say that it's my turn, let me grow with energy emissions heavy growth. There is a big change in the last five years. Let's seize that moment and use the momentum, use the wind in our sails to make a difference. I just want you to know, well, the World Bank will not do it alone, but we are here and we are ready to stand and be counted. Thank you. Um, I think it is very important to recognize that um, majority of people on this planet are actually very good people and they know we have a very big crisis. Uh, and they uh, are willing and very often doing the right thing. Our problem today is that we have a very loud minority, uh, minority of hate, of anger, and the voice of rational behavior and wisdom and goodness gets sometimes brought down. I lead an economic institution, and I want my institution to be that voice of reason but also goodness. We need more equitable, more inclusive, a world that is for everybody a better place. So amplify the voice of goodness. Yes, sir. So I, I was reflecting, courage comes, uh, comes, comes across. I think courage to rise above our, whatever positions we have, um, Rise above our positions, take a great responsibility. Don't hide behind being a, a victim in the system. Um, um, courageous leadership to uh, share dilemmas, to not have all the answers, uh, but to expose your fears and your uncertainty about the topic. Uh, courageous leadership to work with others that you never maybe needed to work with before. And I would say courageous leadership to be a bloody optimist because we need to yes. solve this. So we need optimists because optimists are the ones that engage. We're not in the audience, we're in the field. Sometimes we fail, mm -hmm. but that's the only way we will resolve this. Andre, yeah. uh, bravo yes. my man. Sorry, <laughs> we, we, uh, we're supposed to bring a note of optimism. I'm not sure I have very much optimism to share. I think the current system doesn't work. 
I think we have an opportunity to change the system by using the existing institution and which are well represented here, by trying to make an, to con reconstruct an economy and a system that serves the people, that serves humanity and not certain parts of it only. The future has to be just and equal if you really want it to work properly. And uh, uh, new technologies will allow us to better distribute riches, riches around the place. And we must seize that opportunity. There is no sustainability possible without a balance. And that means we need to reduce inequalities. Thank you. We have a very special guest with us today, uh, Chief Putani. She's uh, from the Yawanawa tribe uh, in the Amazon, in Brazil. And they have developed a model of life which has allowed them to protect and steward the lands, cultural and spiritual identities over thousands of years. And we know that in order for us to live forward and build this future, we also need to look back and harness the wisdom of our ancestors. So here, I would like to invite Chief Putani to close this plenary session. Chief Putani, thank you. A message que eu venho trazer. The message that I have to bring. É, a voz de todos os, os povos da floresta. The voice of all the people of the forest. E nós povos indígenas. And us indigenous peoples. É, a voz da natureza. The voice of nature. A voz da floresta. The voice of the forest. E, e falar que a cura to say that the healing Ela tá dentro da espiritualidade. is within us, our, our spirituality. Ela tá dentro de uma aliança. It's within an alliance. Dentro de toda a união. And the union. De todo o nosso pensamento. Unity of our thoughts. Nós contamos, né, com, pedimos ajuda. We count on you and ask your help. É, de todas as pessoas. All the people que podemos unir as nossas mãos so that we may unite unir o nosso coração hold hands and unite our hearts o nosso pensamento unite our thoughts no, na mesma direção in the same direction né, da cura for healing né, do planeta of the planet e a cura ela é espiritual and the healing is spiritual e quero pedir né é, a, a todas as pessoas so I want to ask all né, the people que a floresta that the forest a nossa floresta our forest ela é a nossa vida is our life e ela está pedindo ajuda and she is asking for help está pedindo que todos nós and podemos asking estar é, unir os nossos pensamentos e o nosso coração we may all be united in our hearts e quando and in todos our nós unimos o nosso pensamento e o nosso coração and when we are all united in our hearts and thoughts a nossa mãe terra our mother earth ela vai nos ouvir will listen to us e muito obrigado thank you very much chinampa kainikin awa chinacha carro awa pacha carro runawa antuma Antuma <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.